Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, we got a few uh, people sitting in the back. So if you're on the outside of your row and you got seats next to you, can you go ahead and just scoot in for me and get real close to your neighbor really quick? That would be awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. My name, is, my name is Miles. I get to be the pastor here at Treasure Coast Community Church, and we're just grateful that you're here. Uh, if you're watching online or if you're out on the lawn with us, we're glad uh, that you are joining us well, as well. Hey, here's, here's one thing that you probably don't know, uh, is every single week, there are over 600 people watching us online. Did you know that? Yeah, I know. It's, it's pretty amazing. I always have, uh, every time I, I get to my Facebook messages, there's usually a message in there from a friend from high school or college uh, that is telling me about the power of the gospel that is impacting their life uh, because they have been watching us online. And that's, that's a credit to your giving. Uh, that's a credit to a lot of people serving all the cameras and things of that sort that you see around this place. It's always a joy to me uh, to watch that happen, especially as I see students doing it uh, because it just puts on display uh, that people here have a heart to serve, uh, that there is a multi-generational aspect to this church. As I look out in the crowd, I see salt and pepper and students and all the likes. And so that is a super great encouragement to me uh, as we think about the family of God in this place. And so, uh, yeah, you can clap. You can clap for that. And so my encouragement to you is one, continue to give because that's why this is possible. And two, uh, if you've been going here for a really long time, if you've invested in this place with your, with your time or your treasure more specifically, but you haven't started serving yet, my encouragement to you would be sit one and serve one. You see all the babies that we have in this place. Kids needs help. And so, uh, and so I encourage you to serve, whether that's working on a door or that's uh, being an usher in here to get people seated or that's over there uh, serving in kids. That's our, that's our encouragement. We're, we're not just asking you to serve um, because we need help. We're also asking you to serve because more importantly, we think it's a part of your spiritual formation uh, that you would give up your time uh, to serve within the body of Christ. And so we would encourage you to do that. Amen. 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 All right. So, hey, let's get, let's get started today. We're going to dive into uh, Colossians chapter three. So if you're following along, you can do so via the YouVersion Bible app. You can go to events uh, and you can go to live and all of the notes for the sermon will be right there. Or you can just follow along in your Bible app uh, in Colossians chapter three. Now, the first week we looked at how Jesus is supreme, right? Jesus, the son, is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn from among the dead, all of those all those things. If you haven't watched that, I would encourage you to go back and watch week one of this series. And then last week, Pastor Chad, man, Pastor Chad did a great, a great job. Don't you agree? He did so awesome. And so last week, Pastor Chad helped us look at how Jesus, how Jesus is triumphant. Jesus is triumphant over, over every other ideology that we may have. Jesus is triumphant over them. And this week, what we're going to look at uh, is how Jesus is how Jesus is transformer. And we believe that Jesus is, is the transformer of our lives and our identities and our, and our worlds. But before we dive into that, I have to ask you a question. Have you ever walked into a place and you felt like you didn't belong? Anybody? Raise your hand. Yeah, if your hand's not raised, you're a liar. And we, we have a lot to talk about. I've, the, the place I think about when I think, oh, man, I didn't, I didn't belong. I just started dating my wife. We had gone out to Oregon because that's where she and her family are from, and, uh, and my wife took me to a country line dancing bar. Now, here's, here's the deal. We're in Oregon, number one. Number two, we're in a country line dancing bar. Within a 20-mile radius, there is not a black or brown brother sister in sight, all right? And so, like, I walked into that bar, and I was like, I don't, I don't belong here. Like... One, I don't dance. Two, like this, I don't, I don't belong in this spot. This isn't for me, you know? And so I, I embraced that, but everything internally in me was fighting to, to belong, like I wanted to belong. And so praise God for my wife and her friends that, that helped me feel at home. They taught me a few new dance moves, and by the end of it, I was having, I was having a ball. I felt like I belonged there. But we all, we all experience this, right? This internal fight 
to belong. Really, it's this internal fight for status, this fight to be the best, this fight to not walk into a room and feel insecure. That's really what it is. And we experience that whether it's in our family or with our friends or, or especially on our, on our jobs. We step into this room and it's like, I, I shouldn't be here. And some of that is, is good. I know as a college student, as I was out and I was partying and I was doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing, like my, my wife and my friends call me a chameleon that I can step into any environment and shape shift and feel at home. But truly, as I was in parties in college, I could be a chameleon in that space, but I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. I felt that. I felt like I don't belong here. But the interesting thing, when it comes to the family of God, when it comes to being in this place, among brothers and sisters in Christ, once we have connected to the life-changing power of Jesus, Jesus communicates to us, often you belong here. You belong specifically, what Jesus communicates to us through the Apostle Paul is you belong in me. Your life is now hidden in Christ Jesus and you belong here and you no longer have to fight for status. You no longer have to feel like you don't belong. And so I'm here to tell you this morning and communicate through the gospel that you belong here. You belong in Jesus. And, and you may be thinking, God, you don't know what I did 25 minutes before I stepped into this place. And you know what Jesus is telling you? You belong here. God, you don't know what I plan to do 25 minutes after I leave this place. And Jesus is still communicating. You belong here. There is nothing that can separate you from my love, not height, nor death, not your sin, not demons, not rulers of this world, not principalities of this world that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He is constantly blaring to you, you belong here. You already belong. You are sons and daughters of the most high God. And even if you haven't connecting to his life-changing power, I can promise you that Jesus is chasing after you, trying to whisper in your ear, you belong here. Colossians 3, Paul writes this chapter, starting in verse 1, to put this internal fight, this internal insecurity, this thought process that we don't belong on display. He says, since then... You have been raised with Christ. He gives us our status first. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then he brings emphasis. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. He's like, you may have to do this on your job. You may have to do this with your friends. You may have to seek for status. You may have to fight for belonging everywhere else. But among the people of God and within my family, you need to know that you belong here because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is no hierarchy. I belong in the same fashion that you belong. You are not better than me. I am not better than you. But we go into the presence of Jesus and look at the cross of Christ and we get to have a a heart that says, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to belong. We all belong at the foot of the cross in the same manner, at the same plane, at the same level, because the ground is level there. And so with our status in mind, we have been raised with Christ. He says, with your status in mind, set your heart on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And what he's saying is he's like, concentrate your mind on the character of Jesus. It's simply that. He's like, concentrate your mind. Think about the character of Jesus Christ often. And so I would ask, how often do you think about the character of Jesus? Every day, he says, think about his blood poured out for you. Every single day, think about Jesus on the cross. Every single day, think about how your life is hidden in him. Every single day, he says, think and meditate on the character of Christ. So when's the last time that you meditated on the character of Jesus? When's the last time that you sat down in, in silence and solitude and you sat with the text? Because if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. And if you want to know who Jesus is, look at the word. And so when's the last time that you sat with Jesus? 
I know for me, like my parents used to get so frustrated because I can, I can rattle off rap songs from like 2008. The, the Kanye 808s and Heartbreak album, I could give it to you like all the way, all the way through. Big Daddy with Adam Sandler, just come at me. We'll watch it, you'll get annoyed because I'll quote the entire thing. And so my, my parents used to get annoyed they used to get so mad because they'd be like, how can you remember that? You can't even remember your schoolwork. And I'm like, because school was boring? Like, come on, bro. My parents are teachers, by the way. And so they used to get so frustrated. And I think God feels that way when it comes, when it comes to the people of God. Is he's like, you can quote all these, all these lyrics, but this old Christian art of, of meditating on the text of scripture and memorizing scripture, somehow we've lost it. We've forgotten the importance, but God's word says, like, hide my word in your heart so that you might not sin against me so that we can meditate and remember the character of Jesus. And so I remember, like, as when I first connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, my, my mentor, Coach Gomes, he used to take these index cards and split them in half and write verses on them, and then he would state them throughout the week up to 100 times, and he would check them, check them off, and he would memorize them, and it's a practice that I've begun to put it back into play in my world, too, because I recognize that concentrating on the character of Jesus is of utmost importance as I want to grow and reflect Jesus to the rest of the world, and I want to remember Remember my status in him. Like I need God's word hidden in my heart. And so concentrating our mind on the character of Jesus is of utmost importance. It allows us as we step into his presence to not just be like, God, I have to come to you perfected because that's, that's how I usually do it. Like I, I feel so frustrated oftentimes because I step into the presence of God and I'm like, I got all these thoughts and frustrations and my brokenness that is on my mind and I try to lay it down before I step to the foot of the cross. And Jesus is like, nah, bro, bring that with you. I want all of that stuff. You don't need to be perfected to get to me. If I needed you perfect, I wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Like, I, just step. Come in. And so you don't have to come in here perfect. I need you to come in here authentic and surrendered, but not perfect. And when you step into the presence of the Lord, when you step in to read his word, he's like, bring everything you got with you. Bring all your mess, bring all your family problems, bring those thoughts that you don't think you're supposed to have. He's like, bring them to me, I want them. Don't leave them at the door when you come in. I wanna talk to them, I wanna speak to them, I wanna transform you by them. So concentrating our mind on the character of Christ does not give us license to lay our problems down before we come to him. He wants them. And so concentrate your mind on the character of Jesus. Remember his word. Hide it in your heart. Remember who Jesus is first. And so the status that Paul talked about earlier in verse 1, the question becomes, how did we get it? Since then, we have been raised with Christ. This is our status. How did we get this? He says, because for you died in verse 3, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And so when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. There's a, there's a profound mystery here that we, we need to understand. Paul's saying when we connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, you and I died. And you're like, nah, bro, I'm very much alive. What are you talking about? And Paul is like, it's, what did you die to is the question. We died to our flesh. We died to our own way. We died with Christ Jesus. That's why, that's why when we baptize people, we say buried with Christ and raised to new life. So, so what does it mean that we died? It means that we have decided when we connected to the life-changing power of Jesus to lay down every single preference, every single ideology, and every single right that we believe we have. And we make Jesus Lord of our life and we submit our life to him. Here's the deal. Jesus was the first one to lay his rights down in this relationship. You just need to know that. God, in perfect righteousness, left his throne, came to earth, wrapped in flesh to save you and I. He laid down every right that he had 
so that he could go to the cross so that his perfect righteousness would be transferred to us and then he took on our sin and he nailed our sin to the cross with him and that is where it remains forever. And so Jesus laid his rights down first and now he asks us to when we step into a relationship with him. And so before we made Jesus Lord of our life, in our flesh, we were dying. The terminal disease of sin had condemned you and I to death. But when we connected to Jesus, what Jesus did for us on the cross, well, it became enough to free us from this terminal sin sick disease. And he took on the sin sickness that was killing us. He nailed it to the cross. And when Jesus resurrected, our new lives were resurrected with him and we were reborn and now we are alive in him. And so Chad talked about this last week, but this picture of in him, it, it escapes my understanding often, and I would, I would beg to say it probably escapes yours. So the question is, how do we live this in him thing out? What does my life is hidden in Jesus mean? What, how does this change how I live on a day-to-day -day basis? How does this even impact me? I don't even fully understand it, but they continue to talk about my life being hidden in Jesus. What does this mean? I'll try and paint the picture as best I can for us. You know when you walk into a room and your friend is like deeply attuned to you? Like they're actually genuinely listening and paying attention? I know it doesn't happen often, but like, you know when that happens? And you're like, you get me. You feel that. You understand me. You're listening to me. You're asking questions. Whoa. I just need you to go to that feeling. You know when that happens. And then that same friend, a couple times a week, that person will text you and they'll check in on you. What begins to happen is your brain and your body will begin to sense that you are in that person's head. And you don't even have to try to make this happen. Your mind will do this automatically. You know that you are on their mind and now they are deeply on yours. And so this notion that we have died and are in Christ means that the old version of us is being put to death and our new lives are hidden in Jesus. And so who is Jesus? Jesus is the body, the church, you and I. And so I am hidden in you and you are hidden in me. I am in your head. I know that sounds a little creepy, just go with me. I am in your head and you are in mine. And so here's the sense that this should give us. Here is the notion here. The notion is that you and I don't go anywhere in which Jesus isn't thinking about us. We don't go anywhere where Jesus doesn't have us on his mind. I don't know if you understand the depth and the importance of that, but no matter where you go, Jesus is right there with you. Jesus is thinking about you. Jesus is pursuing you. Even if you step into places where you know you don't belong, Jesus is thinking about you and not this wrathful God that you are thinking about that is telling you don't do it and ready to hit you, but a God that loves you so much that is pursuing you. This parent that loves you so much that even when you make bad decisions, you are on his mind and his heart is pleading for you. This Jesus has you on his mind. The God of the universe is thinking about you. And I don't know if you understand the full weight of that, but you need to understand that the creator of the universe knows you by name and is thinking about you. We don't go anywhere in which Jesus isn't thinking about us. And so we practically remember this truth by concentrating our mind on Christ Jesus and doing that often. And so Paul says, with this in mind, with the understanding that the life that we live in the body is temporary and that our life is hidden in Jesus, he starts to get practical. He starts to get real practical here. And then he's like, with all of this in mind, put to death therefore. What is the therefore? Therefore, it's therefore because our status is now hidden in Jesus. And so he's like, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And so these lists of practices are like cancer to the limbs. 
They must be cut off or they will infect the entire body. Hear me. These lists of practices are like cancer to the limbs. They must be cut off or they will infect the entire body. And so let's go through the list. I'll explain them briefly. Sexual immorality is any sexual activity outside of marriage. Impurity is the contamination of character affected by a moral behavior. Hear me, we used to tell student athletes all the time when I coached at the high school, I used to tell them, hey, don't cheat in school. Don't cheat in school. They'd be like, come on, coach, like, I didn't have time to study and don't cheat in school. Why? Because I know that if you cheat in school, if you cheat on that test, if you cheat in that class, if you cheat on your homework, the more likely the possibility that you will cheat on me, that you will cheat on your teammates when it comes to this game. If you cheat in there, you're gonna cheat the game. And we're not gonna win championships as a result. And it's the same thing with sin. Sin bleeds into every aspect of your life. You can't begin to sin and, and say, hey, sin, sin never stays where you put it, by the way. Sin, stay here. It don't stay. It's the worst dog ever. <laughs> it doesn't stay. Sin doesn't get isolated. You don't sin in a vacuum. Sin will begin to bleed into every aspect of your life, and it will cause damage more than you want it to. Sin impacts everything. He goes on, lust, uncontrolled sexual urges, greed, unchecked hunger for physical pleasure, idolatry devoted to anything other than God. And so hear me, sin starts with this idea of gratification. That's why we've been saying often, and I hope you get tired of communicating it back to me, is the scene of the crime is your, right, the scene of the crime is your, Right, sin starts with an idea of gratification. The scene of the crime is your mind. It just is. And so if it's not put to death, it, pre it presents itself as a temptation. And if it's not put to death, it's held on to. And then it becomes cherished. My wife says, sin is like a tempting cookie. She's a foodie, so everything has a, has a food analogy. Once you nibble the edge, you get used to the taste, and then you want to take a bigger bite. And so to put something to death, we must cut off its supply. And so I would ask, what fuels your evil desires? What triggers you? What do you watch, listen to, or see that prompts the idea of sin in your head? Is it that show? Is it that influencer? Is it that podcast? Is it going to the gym at 5 p.m.? What is it? What prompts evil desires in your heart and in your mind? What, what is it? See, we have a responsibility to investigate the lifelines of whatever sins are defeating us personally and then cut them off without pity. I remember when I first connected to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, like there were, there were friends that I had in my phone that I would, I would get substances from that I had to delete their number. There were girls that I used to hang out with that I had to delete their number. I had to cut off the lifelines of sin in my world. And so what are the lifelines that you have that you need to cut off? We are to love Jesus so much that we hate our evil desires. We're supposed to love Jesus and hate our sin. So our responsibility is to take our thoughts captive and we have done everything to cut off the lifeline of evil desires and they still prompt us because that's, that's how the enemy works. Then we have community that we can call. Then we have a brother or sister in Christ that we have authentic biblical and confessional community with. We have somebody that we can pick up the phone with. We have a life group. That's why life groups are so important that we can step into and we can say, man, I switched up my gym routine. I started going at 5 a.m., but bro, there was a new girl that walked in. I was not ready for it. I need help. Can you go with me? Can you help me find a new spot? Or maybe I, I just need to tell you so this doesn't compound in my world. What do you have? Do you have people around you that you can go to when stuff like that happens? Paul says, because of sin, the wrath of God is coming in verse six. And he says, it's easy for us to drift into a sin that we cannot name or identify. So he continues this list of vices. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. 
He's like, anger is the continuous state of hatred. Rage is when anger breaks out in actual deeds or words. Malice is evil intended cause to hurt. Slander is speech which puts malice into practice and filthy language or words that contaminate both the speaker and the hearer of them. James tells us, he's like, be slow to speak, slow to become angry. And so before we speak to anyone, before we post about anything, we need to remember that the people we're posting about, the people we're speaking to, are made in the image of God. And so Paul wraps up with one final vice in verse nine, and he says this, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. And what he's saying ultimately is like, truth is inconvenient. You feel that, you know that. The whole truth is often inconvenient or it's embarrassing. And we're constantly tempted to bend truth into a less awkward or embarrassing shape. We just are. And so for those of us that are in the room that are the gentle people and and try not to give the whole truth because the whole truth may hurt, just remember it's more unloving to keep the truth than to lie. And for those of us that consider ourselves truth tellers, where are you? I am that individual. Just remember that your truth, our truth, is that we deserve death, hell, and the grave. And it is only by God's grace and mercy and love for us that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And so be gentle as you tell the truth. Be gentle. The last question that I, that I have to ask is like, is this, is this Christian code of ethics that Paul presents to us, is it realistic? Like, can we do this? I, I think like, if I'm, if I'm honest, that's the question that I ask myself as I studied this. Like, is this real, can I do this, Jesus? This metaphor of taking clothes off isn't about making a New Year's resolution to behave differently. It's not what this is about. These actions that Paul speaks about are reflective of our new status. He's like, you can only do this if you know who you are. If you know whose life yours is hidden in. You can only do this if you remember that you are in Christ Jesus. For we have changed statuses, we have changed families. You and I were once identified by sin, by death, by the grave, and literally we were walking zombies. He's like, we used to live by the rule of death and now we live by the rule of life that is governed by Christ Jesus. We have submitted our lives to him. And so if you struggle with submitting your life to him, if you struggle with submitting your rights to Jesus, if you struggle with submitting your ideologies and your preferences, you're gonna have a hard time doing this because your status is not truly under Christ. He's like, if you can't attain or understand your status in Jesus, you're gonna have a hard time doing these things. This isn't about behavior, this is about identity. And that's why Paul closes in this way in verse 11. He says, here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Here is not a place It's a family. And if you haven't heard me at all throughout this lesson, hear me now, please. The melting pot of ethnicities that Paul is writing to, they would have felt this statement in verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. They would have felt this in their bones because they would have known he's talking to me. And I need you to know that Paul is talking to you. The Gentile Greeks that Paul is writing to after the conquests of Alexander the Great would have regarded themselves as the elite. They would have been the best people in the planet. The ethnic Jews that now were following Jesus would have believed that their religion was the best and they would have frowned upon the Greeks that were now converting to Christianity. The barbarians were anyone who did not speak the Greek language and no one really vibed with them at all. The Scythians were extreme examples of barbarians and they were honestly just a little better than savages. 
Slaves, they ran through the ancient society and it had a damaging impact on their human relationship and on their personal self-esteem. The ancient world, listen to me, the ancient world, just like our modern world, was an elaborate network of prejudice, of suspicion, and of arrogance. I know that our world seems crazy and volatile and chaotic, but you need to hear me. The ancient world was much worse, and the only reason we feel like we have it really bad is because we have 24-7 cable. All of these barriers which divided these people groups that were now connecting to the life-changing power of Jesus, all of these people were now Jesus followers. That's who Paul's writing to. He's writing to the church. And he's like, all of you guys are in the church, Scythians, barbarians, Greeks, Jews. You guys are now a part of the body of Christ. And all of these barriers and distinctions he's trying to communicate to them were broken down through the blood of Jesus. He was like, you are no longer identified by that. You are now identified by the blood of Christ. Why? Because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Your status as a follower of Jesus takes preeminence. You are a follower of Jesus first before you are anything else. Before I'm a black man, I'm a follower of Jesus. Before you're a Republican or Democrat, you're a follower of Jesus. He's like, all of these statuses, all of these things that you want to label yourself with, he's like, they fall in submission to you being a follower of Christ Jesus. And if the Republican Party or the Democratic Party submits you to do something that the Father does not submit you to do, then throw it out and you fall under me. He's like, if you don't get that, then you can't live this out yet. Understand your status first. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Why? For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you say that our lives are hidden in you. Thank you for telling us that we belong. God, let us never forget that. Let us never forget that our lives are hidden in Jesus and help us, help us meditate on the character of Jesus. Help us dive into authentic, biblical, confessional community. Help us submit our lives to you and to you alone. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for transforming our lives. In your name we pray, amen.